my uh, water bottle. So thank you, brother. Well, thank you. We uh, we appreciate that um, by far. And uh, I actually thought you guys forgot pastor appreciation, and that was cool. Actually, I almost in one of our staff meetings said not to do it. Hey, switch switch me out, Waters. Actually, I'm sorry to be a diva. Um, but then I was like, well, they forgot, so I'm not, I don't have to, you know, and, and because I, I never want the focus to be on me, but rather I want it to be on the Lord, but I'm very appreciative and I'm uh, intrigued how you got all those, all those little messages without me knowing about it. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, but you know, but that's a good thing about leadership because one thing about embarking and, and putting good leadership into place is that, uh. Uh, I don't have to know everything that's going on, you know, even though I usually got a pretty good agenda or idea of what's happening. But that's a lot of times people text me about stuff about what's going on with this group or that group. I say, I don't know. Text the group leader or pastor or whatever the situation is. They should be able to fill you in on the topic of discussion. But I appreciate you guys, and I love you all. We we uh, love being here. We've committed ourselves to this place. And, um, man, over the past uh Almost four years now, we've been through some bumps and bruises, haven't we? It's been a roller coaster ride, and there's been a lot of, um, a lot of trials to overcome, and there's been a lot of uphill climbing to get to where we are now. And for those of you who know what it was like when I first took over as pastor, the sanctuary looked com- very different, not just phys- physically, but uh, bodies, all right? <laughs> Uh, we was trying to hide chairs, <laughs> you know, and so, but uh, it's thankful because uh, the Lord has blessed and we have grown and we have a, a children's ministry downstairs that is working and moving and alive and vibrant. We have a youth ministry that is creative and coming up with all sorts of crazy stuff and uh, just, well, they're crazy too. <laughs> Um, we have our hope groups that are coming up starting starting Wednesday. That's going to be amazing. We have Dave and Kathy that's going to be over our kingdom marriages. Shay and Kendrick, throw the hands up. They're going to be over kingdom singles. And there, there was Dave for the kingdom marriages, yeah. Kingdom seniors over here with Miss Sue, give me a wave. Um, of course, Kylie and um, uh, our youth pastors are going to have, yes, Aiden, thank you, Bryson. <laughs> They're going to be over our youth small groups as they do youth youth uh, youth services on Sunday nights, and Mr. Sean's going to be in um, class with our our uh, children's ministry for small groups, and then I'm going to be doing the connect track. Uh, so it's going to be an awesome time, and so we've just seen the Lord Lord move here and grow in many different ways, uh, grow us, and and not only just growing us in ministry, but He's grown us a lot through this church, hasn't He? I mean, the church, nothing looks the same really in here. Uh, well, I guess the carpet and the chairs look the same. Uh, we're after the carpet next. Can I get an amen? amen. The carpet is next. So we have done, we've done a radical transformation in this sanctuary, and I think it looks pretty good. All right. <laughs> but we'll be after the carpet next, and we'll do that after the first of the year because we want to get you involved. I think it's going to be a pretty unique way to get the family involved and in how we're going to tackle that and how we're going to accomplish getting this um, place, uh, new carpet place down and all that good stuff. And, of course, the outside, there's been some major transformations. We declared it, and God has done it. Amen? And uh, we used to have an old, ugly shack of a house sitting on this lot over here. And... Uh, you know, God provided a way, and we got that house knocked down. We threw a little gravel out to make an exit. We put up a secondary location, so we have storage, and we've been able to do outreach. We have our field of dreams out there where we're able to go out and do some awesome stuff. Speaking of which, team apostles are throwing down on team evangelists. This turkey bowl, Thanksgiving Day, 9 a.m., is going down. The apostles lead the way. And by the way, if you're a Steelers fan, you want to be on team apostles. If you want to remain <laughs> unvictoried, <laughs> you can join Henry's team because the Bengals ain't winning nothing this year. Can I get an amen from my Steelers fans? All right. 
<laughs> but listen, let's get into the Word of God this morning. I'm going to continue on uh, the same track. Worship has been on my heart lately. And uh, many of you may feel like you're a victim of my crime here. And you feel like I'm coming after you, but I'm not. I feel like God wants us to embark in something that is much different. And I feel like God wants us to seek his heart. He wants us to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Amen. God wants for us desire to desire him and to chase after him. And all of these things will be added unto you. Does anybody believe that from scripture? Amen. Because my Bible tells me that his promises are yea and amen. So if God says that if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and he will add all these things unto you, then I just have to pause for a minute and believe that all all these things will be added unto me, amen? And I don't have to worry about what these things are or where these things are coming from, amen? Just like that day I prophesied that God was going to send $10,000 to take care of the side lot over here. And you better believe before I spoke it, it was very audacious, and I felt bold in my spirit, but when it got let out, I was a little worried for a second. Hence, I made the trip to the mailbox every single day, even on Sundays, to see if that $10,000 check was in there that I proclaimed was coming, and it took about three months. Amen. I was getting worried. But God said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what? All right. Y'all are tired, man. It's not spring ahead. It's fall back. Y'all should be extra energized today, right? All right. Y'all know how this goes. We're going to pick up the text in um, 2 Samuel 6, if you want to turn your Bibles there. And we're going to talk about hosting his presence this morning. Last week we talked about being a worshiper and we talked about the element of revealing our hearts and having faith that produced obedience. And we concluded our talk last week realizing that our worship must cost us something. After all, it was David who said, I will not give to my God something that cost me nothing, correct? I cannot give to my God a worship in which I didn't pay for. And David said, I am going to do that. We, we met the, the woman in Luke who came in and, and sat around the edges where the Pharisees were trying to catch Jesus up and they were seeking to humiliate him. And she poured a flask on him of anointment oil, the Bible says, and if we studied that out, it would have cost her a year's wages. Her worship literally cost her a year of her finances. She was seeking after God in the way that, that was a penalty to her, the way that cost her, a way that she had to pay for. And I wonder on Sunday morning at RHC 302 State Street, are we bringing to God something that costs us something, something in which will inhabit God, uh, to cause God to inhabit the praises of his people? as the Bible says, amen. Will God inhabit our praises? Will we have a big praise? Will we have a big host this morning? Or will we have a small host? You see, the presence of God is never contingent on God. Let me blow somebody's theology there for just a moment. The presence of God in this building... Sunday morning is never contingent on God. It's contingent on you and I because the Bible says that he will inhabit the praises of his people. Amen. So if I give a small praise, I get a small inhabitation. If I praise him, come on, and I let him know, and I'm thankful, and I bring glory unto his name, and I don't let rocks cry out on my behalf, and I go whatever all out looks like for me. I go for broke. I give worship that costs me something. Then I'm going to get the inhabitation of the Lord. Amen. The presence of his spirit that overflows and fills the this room. Furthermore, I'm not just looking to fill a room, but I'm looking to be refilled myself. Amen. Come on. I'm looking for something to happen in my body. So his, his, his presence is there based off of my praise. And the Bible says in second Samuel chapter six this morning. And David returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Moving on to verse 21, and David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord and I will make myself yet more. He says, and, and the KJV says, I will make myself more undignified than even this. And I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them shall 
I beheld in honor. Let us pray this morning. Father, we ask that you would guard me in protection. Lord, that you would speak what you desire to speak, Lord God. That you would give me words to say as you allow me to preach your word on worship this morning, God. That you allow me to speak on the ability to host your presence in this house. God, I believe that we are a building. God, I believe that we are a people. God, I believe that we are a movement that is ripe to host your presence, God. To go forth and carry the presence of the Spirit of God in this city to carry the spirit of God as the presence in this house and amongst this people and in Jesus name I pray amen we find ourselves in the middle of a domestic dispute here. Mikhail is not pleased with her husband, King David. Uh, she felt that he is not carrying himself in an upright manner, right? He's not carrying himself as a king should. She felt that he should carry himself in a much more different manner, maybe in the manner of her father who was previously the king, right? She looked upon David with contempt and said, you know what, my daddy didn't do it like that, so I want to know why you're doing it like that. Why are you out here dancing before these maid servants? Why are you making yourselves undignified, as the KJV would say? But David, on the other hand, has something that is happening for him because he is bringing the Ark of the Covenant back in, or the Ark of the Lord back into the city. And he realizes that this is a place of victory for him. This is a moment that David has fought for as a king. He, he has lost a friend over this moment. He has lost sleep over this moment. He is worried over this moment. He has prayed over this moment. Surely he has given sacrifices over this moment. So for David, there is something special about hosting the presence of the Lord and leading the Ark of the Covenant back in to the city. He knew that this moment was something to be spoke about and something to be cherished as he is bringing the presence of the King of Kings back in and the Lord of Lords and the Lord of Hosts back into the city. Something that was failed to do prior to him. And even under his very own leadership, the failure to bring the presence of the Lord in. And the inability to host the very presence of God. Can you imagine what David would have felt like for those moments when his friend reached out and touched to stable the cart that the ark of the Lord was on and he struck dead and they have to seize their operation and they are no longer able to pursue and continue forward with bringing the presence of God into the city. I mean, here we are on a Sunday morning and we're seeking to come in and we are seeking to worship and all of us, and not there's none of us that come in on a Sunday morning and say, man, I surely hope that God doesn't move unless you're really hungry and didn't have breakfast, you know what I'm saying? And then you're like, oh, man, come on, just preach it straight through, Pastor. Come on, let's just get on. I'm looking for Lone Star. I'm looking for Texas Roadhouse or something. Come on, uh, subbies, whatever y'all trying to get, you know, there's always those people. But for the most part, most of us come in and we're expecting some Something to happen. But what if in our, our efforts to move forward, in our efforts to bring the presence or to host the very presence of God, we, we mishandle the presence of God and everything that we are trying to do as a congregation and through a worship service, we seize the operation. We have to delay. We have to pause. We have to put the presence of God elsewhere and we have to go back and we have to make sacrifices and we have to purify ourselves before we, you know, David felt that very thing. I mean, how would it be that we come in at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning and we're seeking to bring in the presence of God and we have to say, hold on a second, we've mishandled the presence. We have to postpone service. I hope that nobody came for something spiritual this morning. I hope that nobody came for deliverance or for freedom in the house of the Lord this morning. I hope that nobody came to be saved or set free. Come on, somebody, right? We've got to postpone because we have improperly handled the presence of God. We've got to go get ourselves ready to handle the presence of God because we have not put preparation into the presence, into handling his presence. That's exactly where King David has already found himself at. Not handling the presence of God in the way that he should. Improperly handling the presence. And this weight is on him. But he finds himself in a new, new scenario where he comes in dancing and playing music. The Bible would tell us because the presence of the Lord is coming with him. Because he has went back and devoted himself. He has went back and tried himself. He has went back and he has fasted. He has prayed. He has prepared. He has enabled himself to bring the presence of the Lord and to host the presence of God. 
No, I think that sometimes if we want to get real honest with ourselves, we do the very same thing, don't we? You know, we know that as Christians, the spirit of the Lord is Pentecostal Christians and, and people of the spirit. Spirit-filled movement, we understand something that happened on the day of Pentecost. We understand that at the moment of salvation, there's an indwelling of the Spirit of God. And we understand that, that, that God seeks to, through the Holy Spirit to enable us to walk in power and to give us spiritual gifts and to move through us through His spiritual gifting and allow us to flow into His Spirit, right? But there are ways that even with that indwelling of the Spirit that we improperly handle or we reach out and touch the cart that the presence of God is coming on. And we cause ourselves to pause when we need God the most. And I'm just going to be real plain for a second. And some of y'all not going to like me for it, but that's okay. Because you already gave me my card in my little treasure box. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm glad y'all did that first. Because some of y'all might have been writing something different in a minute. But you know, we do things like watch R-rated movies on Saturday night and then come in on Sunday and want to know why God's not moving on us. We allow our things to hear words of vulgarity and taking God's name in vain to uh, pass our ears, but we classify it as a form of entertainment, and then we wonder why God's not moving. Thou shalt not take God's name in vain, right? And, and here we are allowing that to go into our mind, but then we come into a place. Uh, uh, there was a meme the other day, and, and it, it talked about how uh, uh, the presence of the mind is affected by we, what we watch and how people are so uh, obsessed with this thing that they'll tell you that watching movies of witchcraft or supernatural, demonic activity, or or, or d d enabling themselves to be a part of these other things don't mean anything because it's just a fantasy. It's, it's just a movie that I'm watching for an hour and a half to two hours, yet the Super Bowl will pay $3.8 million for just a few seconds to advertise something because they know, and you know deep down inside, because they know that what they can show you for just a few seconds on the, most, uh, on the largest watch thing in America, the most televised event in America, if they can just slip you a few moments of something they can change the way you are thinking about something and yet we go and we allow ourselves to be in the place of these vulgar things and these things that that are not of God and we allow ourselves to participate in things and we want to know why things like why is God not moving in our life when we've got Netflix open to things we shouldn't be watching and our Bible collects dust on the bookshelf yet we want to know why the cart is enabled on the side of the road and why we're not hosting the presence of God and why we're now, listen, I'm not the most holy man. I, I live in flesh myself, too, and so I like to watch Netflix. And the problem is I like movies, right? Come on, that's the problem. But do I like the presence of God, or do I like God's name taken in vain more? Do I like to see nude sex scenes on the show that I'm watching, or do I want the presence of God more, right? We've got to do make up our minds sometimes that when it goes too far, we've got to learn to turn that thing off and move forward. Otherwise, we may be... My kids, man, they, they drive me nuts sometimes. It can be the slightest of little things, right? Something I'm not even, and it's like, oh, Dad, we can't watch this. What's he saying? I am talking about you. Okay, yeah. And I'm like, dude, uh, we'll just watch it a little bit more just to see, make sure it won't, you know what I mean? And not my kids, though, man. If they're there and it's even, it can be the most G-rated thing that they think and you think it's all good. Uh-uh, uh-uh, Dad. Uh-uh, that's not okay. That's not okay. That's not okay. They mess around because it cusses, yeah. We don't say, oh, my God, in my house, okay? Bryson's, uh, okay, I know, Bryce. I'm, I'm trying to help some people here, okay? I'm sad you can't be in class today. <laughs> And so, if they say that on a television show, my kids are trying to get me to turn it off. And then we tell our kids not to say, oh my gosh, because when they say, oh my gosh, it sounds like, oh my God. And for us, we feel like that's taking the name, Lord, uh, the name of the Lord in vain. Because we're not properly using the name of God. We're using it in a way that is, that is vulgar to the name of God because we're using it as an expression, right? What is the difference in that and saying uh, Jesus Christ when you hit yourself with a hammer, right? Or you hit your hand with a hammer and you say, oh, my God, right? What is the difference, right? To me, I don't see the difference. And so we don't say it. But let them say it on the TV show, and we got to turn this thing off, right? Somebody, Proverbs 22 and 6, be nipping you in the butt sometimes, right? Oh my, I'm like, I was just getting into that movie. 
But dad, they cussed. Well, it's not, I mean, it's not technically a cuss word because it's not, but you can't do that, right? Right, because you're talking yourselves out. But you guys get what I'm saying, right? Sometimes we reach out and touch that cart with things that seem okay because we want to pleasure ourselves in certain ways that seem insignificant, but they affect us in major ways. Hence why the Super Bowl commercials cost $3.8 million for a few seconds of your time because they realize if they can drop a thumbnail into your mind, if they drop enough thumbnails in there, you will eventually have a movie that's playing through your mind. And when you're trying to seek the presence of God, you've got to fight through this thing. If anybody doesn't know what a thumbnail is, it's that thing that showed to you on YouTube or, or uh, Vimeo as you go to watch it. There's a thumbnail there. You get enough thumbnails in your mind, and eventually you got a full movie, right? And next thing you know, we got a full movie of things that uh, cause us to reach out and touch the cart and allows us to block what God is trying to do in our lives because we got to fight through this reel that is constantly playing in our minds. You're like, well, pastor, that's legalistic. You can call it what you want. But I know that what happens in our mind, how do you distinguish between your mind uh, uh, haunted movies versus things really being haunted in real life? You are allowing that to seep into your unconscious, and then you have to come in on a Sunday morning, and you have to fight through those things that you've allowed to leash, unleash over your body, and you have to walk through things that have been allowed in your presence, right? Come on, there's a reason that scary people go to scary movies because they want to be in fear. People go to haunted houses because they want to be made afraid right that's the whole thrill of it right but watch this the bible says that god did not give us a spirit of fear so if a spirit of fear does not come from god who does the spirit of fear come from and so if what come on somebody i know that's not what you want to hear on a sunday morning but it's not halloween anymore so i guess we can preach on it y'all got a whole year to chew it over right <laughs> some's like i am leaving this church but right come on just for a minute, right? Can, can we play that logic out for just a second? If I go to a haunted house and it makes me afraid, or I watch scary movies and they give me nightmares, but the Bible says that God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but he gave me a spirit of power. What am I doing when I enter those thumbnails? In? I'm reaching out and I'm touching that cart and I'm stopping the presence of God from entering into my life. I'm pausing what God wants to do. And there's many Christians that fill the seats and pews who have been saved longer than I've been alive and they wonder why God's not able to do with them what they want God to do because you're improperly handling the cart that's carrying the presence of the Lord and you're warring through the demonic warfare that we allow to enter into our lives there's no difference in our subconscious because it's there it's implanted it's a seed it's put in but David realized in this moment that he had overcome this situation where he allowed himself to improperly handle the presence of God. He is now uh, delighting himself in worship, and he's coming over with Jehovah Nissi, his banner, and he's worshiping before him. Because in this moment where he is, he has overcome. He has overcome the moment where he had to pause God's movement in his life, and, and God is moving. And so the Bible says that David played music before for the Lord and he danced. It's a scene that can be seen in most of our churches today, right? We play music and we dance. Some of us jump. Some of us are pumping. Some of us are praying. Some of us are, are sitting and allowing the spirit of the Lord to come on us. And our worship teams are singing for us songs of glory and honor to God. And we should be shifting from one state of glory to another state of glory. Amen. As we declare that we are in the presence of God. Just as I have said last week, though, I am afraid that many of us show up into worship sets and we, we have an idea that we have left in worship when we have not. Because we have paused where God wants for us to be. Or because we've not revealed our heart before God. The word says of David that he was a man after God's own heart, though. You remember last week when I told us the way to truly know if we are after God is if our worship is revealing our heart. That's how you know if your worship is real or not. Does it reveal your heart? But we find another in this scenario in the midst of this experience, Michal. Michal is David's wife. She's the daughter of Saul. And she's that person in worship. Come on, can we just be real for a second? Anybody ever just been getting it in worship? You know when you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like somebody's staring at you? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Now, you know they say that that's a spider most of the time. Weird. 
But you know when you're worshiping, man, and you really get and you feel in the spirit, and you feel like that spider's watching you. And you look at her, and you look over, and it's somebody like this. You ever been in worship, and you heard somebody, uh, uh, maybe not specifically about you, but I've heard of other people. Is all that really necessary? Whew. Come on, I've heard it about some people before. Is all that really necessary? Is what they do? I, I, I know some people that, that think that we, we, we just a big concert on Sunday mornings here at RHC, and so they ask about us. I've, I've heard the statement before. They didn't know I was the pastor. <laughs> is all that really necessary? I was intrigued. All of what? You know, that speaking in tongues and, and that hollering and all that worship and the lights and stuff. Well, I mean, God was the creator of all things. God created lights and, and roars of thunder, right? And, and every color that there is imaginable that we have, right? So why not allow that? Why not give glory to God by, by displaying that in our church? And the Bible says that the angels sing, holy, holy is he. And every time that they move around God, they see a new dimension of who God is. And so they proclaim a new a portion of his holiness that had not yet been revealed to who they were. Amen. Come on. Somebody, that's what we get in worship. Amen. Because as they go around God inhabiting him and allowing him to inhabit their praise every time. Oh, not the iPad. <laughs> we get a brag for me. Every time that they move around God, they get a new image or a revelation of who God is. And so they declare his holiness. Yeah. So I think that all of that is necessary. Amen. She's put off by David's worship. She's that person who you look over on a Sunday morning and they're just glaring at you because you're doing all that stuff that seems unnecessary, amen? They're looking at you sideways because you're jumping up and down and you're running through the congregation or you're prophesying or speaking in tongues, whatever the thing may be. Now, hold on a second. Let's close here because worship is not about our style. It's the fact that you worship that matters, amen? She's got it, Miss Deb. Thank you. It's the fact that we worship that matters. That has never happened to me before. It's the fact that we worship that matters. I don't care if you sit, crawl, dance, run, jump, fall while you worship. I don't care if you touch everybody in the aisle with you and pray over them. I don't care if you fall on your face or fall on your back, amen. I don't care if you're at the altar the whole time worship's going on or you're falling over on your seat. I don't care if you're so induced by the Spirit of God that you can't do anything but worship and cry and weep in your seat. As long as you are taking your position, whatever that position is, may be before the Lord in worship, right? Not before man. That's the problem that happens so many times is we find ourselves in a place of man's approval rather than the approval of God, amen? And that's exactly where Mikhail found herself. She was looking for the approval of man rather than God because her daddy was king. And David is her husband who's now king and he's not carrying himself like a king should carry himself. Well, come on, somebody. You must not have been there when I got saved. But I know what the Lord done brought me through somebody and so I know what my worship's got to look like from time to time amen and it may not look like a pastor's worship and it may not look like a bishop's worship but sometimes I just got to get a little ugly when I get my praise on somebody come on about three of you been there the Bible said in verse 14, dropping back, then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. In other words, this dude had danced himself out of his clothes, out of his royal garment. He had uncovered his fleshly platform in the state where he could reveal himself. That says something in the nature of who we are, right? Watch. If physically, he danced before the Lord with all of his might, and he was wearing a linen ephod. He had come out and was exposed physically. He had underwear on, y'all. Sometimes I think the reason we don't walk in the freedom of God is because spiritually, we're too worried about being dignified before man, and we're seeking the approval of other people in our worship instead of letting go and exposing ourselves before God. Who cares if the person next to you doesn't like how you worship? I bet they didn't walk what you walked through to get here. Come on. They didn't go through the hell that you went through. They ain't been to the places you've been through. The isolation, the anxiety, the depression, the drug addiction, the alcoholism, pornography, whatever the case may be. So what if they, come on. Mikhail's problem was she was worried about the approval of what her worship looked like before man rather than what her worship could look like before God. 
I love what happens here because this term for dancing that's used in verse 14 and 16 appears nowhere else in Scripture. It's nowhere else in Scripture that we see this, and it describes a whirling dancing. This was a worship that revealed his heart for the past failures that he had went through and the current victory that he is walking with in God. Come on, somebody. I've come to tell you on a Sunday morning, you're not fighting for victory, but you're fighting from a place of victory, and this is the moment that David was walking in. He was walking. Rather, rather the Scripture tells me that he was whirling in this moment. Come on, somebody. Come on, anybody ever seen Anthony whirl? He was doing like Anthony before the presence of the Lord. He was whirling in the presence of God. It was uncontrollable. It was undeniable. And he had uncovered himself in a way that would allow himself to be exposed. His worship was something that truly revealed his heart. That produced obedience through faith. I mean, how faithful do you have to be to touch the cart? To seize the presence of God from coming into your city. And to be able to go back and see that same battle again, but yet walk in it in victory. It cost him something. What I find ironic in this story, though, is that Mikkel had the opportunity to join the one that she was married to. Rather, she became critical of his celebration with his relationship of the Lord. She watched from her window. She watched from this place that was comfortable. And I fear that much of the church in America has come to this place of comfortable Christianity. And we've come to this place of comfortable worship, amen. We can comfortably worship in this setting. And we can comfortably come in here and it can comfortably look like what it needs to look like. And as long as we stay where we are, we can hold ourselves in dignity because we are, after all, this whatever title we carry in ministry. After all, we are second or third or fourth generation church of God. And don't you know who daddy was or granddaddy was? Or, you know, and I'm not being disrespectful, church of God, by any means, but, or you're third, fourth generation Christian or you're 13th, 14th generation Christian. And you hear that all the time because people, you hear that in the church. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know that it doesn't really matter who you are? When we come into a place of worship, Worship isn't about who you are. It's about who he is. Amen. And this is what Mikhail had missed because she's in the window watching David. Don't you know who you are? And David's down there whirling before God saying, don't you know who he is? She had the opportunity to go into the midst of that style of worship, but she was missing it because of her status. Oh, but not David. Not David. David embraced devotion while Mikkel embraced distance. David embraced celebration while Mikkel embraced criticism. David, oh my goodness. David embraced freedom while Mikkel embraced fear. David embraced authenticity while Mikkel embraced audacity of judging another's worship. For Mikkel, she was raised in this palace with the wrong attitude. The daughter of a king, she was a palace dweller. She had developed an attitude of entitlement that caused her to be judgmental of other spirits. She shared her father's lack of spiritual understanding, and she saw the world through her selfish eyes. She reminds me of the prodigal son in a sense, of course, not in the return, but in her way of going because she felt that everything was hers for her using, but not David. His mentality was a little bit different than her. His mentality was different. It was one that was on spiritual eyes, and it allowed a, a difference between them that was enormous. For her, she was the one who looked upon the despised when he became the dancer. Because after all, it was King David who was brought in and who was anointed the last. When they came to anoint the kings, David was where? In the field. When they went out to battle, David was where? He was in the field. When he went out to that battle to bring his brothers some lunch and to serve him, they mocked him and told him to go home. And then it was David who stood up and said, no, I will fight. And they told him he couldn't fight because he couldn't wear the king's armor. You see, it was David who took an opportunity to understand that he was the despised, but now he can become the distinguished and not have to worry about being the dignified. You see, there was a shift in his status because he understands that he was the one that was often left out and forgotten about, but he is now here with the presence of God moving forward. 
The skeptics will always look for a way out, but the devoted will look for a way in. Skeptics focus on people, but the devoted focus on his presence. Skeptics stagnate while the devoted elevate. She was a skeptic and he was devoted. She took a palace mentality over his pasture mentality. And it comes down to a state of mind when we come into this house and worship, doesn't it? One was raised as royalty and the other was raised tending sheep on the back 40 of his father-in-law's field. Sometimes those of us in the palace begin to take for granted what we have, don't we? We take for granted that we can come into this sanctuary and we have a worship team that is going to be on point on a Sunday morning. We take for granted that the spirit of the God, the spirit of the Lord shows up and moves in this place. And we take for granted the things that happen. And, and oftentimes that can become the mentality because we get so focused on what we have, we forget about what we need. David didn't have to be recognized. He didn't have to have a title. He didn't have to have a position. David said, I'm just glad to be here. Come on, somebody. Those are the words he penned in Psalm 122 and 1. He, he said his relationship is all about the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But you know what happens sometimes? People get so stuck on the identity of who their earthly father is. They forget about coming into the presence of their spiritual father. Mikkel was identified by who her father, King Saul, was. David had learned to identify himself through all of his struggles, from being counted last and being counted out, from being mocked when he'd come to that field for the battle, when Goliath stood out there in that field and mocked the people of God. David said, I, I will battle them. And they said, you're just a shepherd. You're nothing. You're a nobody. You can't even fit into the king's armor. David knew what it was to walk in the Father's presence and not somebody else's. The Bible said that in verse 20, David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of his maidservants as one of the base fellows shamely uncovers himself. She found herself, because of her identity, belittling the worship of the devoted. She tried to make his worship something that it was not. And she tried to make his worship undesirable. The truth of the matter is, here on a Sunday morning, there have been people in your life that have tried to convince you that your worship is undesirable. They've talked about who you were before. They've talked about where you've been. They've questioned why you worship like that, why you give like that, why you're devoted like that, why you continue to move on the way you do, why you are in the presence of God. Why do you go to church every Sunday? Why do you seek the presence of God? And they try to make what you were doing before the Lord undesirable. Those are people who have found their identity in the wrong place. But David said, I'm devoted. I'm devoted. And one of the things that I, I hate the most, and we don't get that much here, but as I was raised up in ministry and coming through different things, is when you would see young, excited people, young people get saved for the Lord, or new converts, and then we get on fire for God, right? And you would hear some of the old saints, just give it time. Just give it time. It'll fade. The fire will burn. They'll, they'll catch some reality to church of God he was a worshiper before anything you cannot make it on the praise of other people not your pastor not your music director you must experience this thing for yourself you must experience this thing called worship for yourself and to push in to where God is and you have to be willing to step up and to step in and say that no matter what I'm going to worship before the Lord 
I don't care what happens. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care who's staring at me. I don't care who says I shouldn't be here. I don't care who says that I'm not an overcomer. I'm an overcomer by the presence of Bring me forth so that I can carry your presence. There are some of us in here today that have allowed the criticism of others to define how we worship. I've come to tell you today you can be set free from that. I don't care what anybody else has said about you. I don't care how, it, it, what they've said about how you dance, how, how you worship, how you, how, you, how you speak a heavenly language when you come through and worship. I don't care what they've said about your worship. You can have freedom in this house today. There are some of you that have felt so safeguarded in this house that you literally keep yourself covered spiritually so that the Lord cannot move on you. But David exposed himself going all the way down to his linen ephod, dancing and whirling before God, spiritually exposing who he is. Come on, there are some of you in here that we need to worship like that today. I will celebrate before the Lord. David said this. He said, I will become more undignified than even this. <laughs> Come on, some of you need to be willing to say that this morning. I'm asking some of you to step into a place of worship today that you haven't stepped into in a long time. I'm asking some of you to allow yourself to come unglued and to step out and worship the Lord. To get into the presence of God. To taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe for some of you today, you've got to look at that person in your row and you've got to say, hey, you haven't seen anything yet. I will become more undignified than even this if it means that I can host the very presence of who God is in my life. Jesus, you are worthy in this place. Come on, God is calling for this church to be a church that carries his presence. Jesus, you are worthy. Just want to be with you. Just want to be with you. King of glory, fill this place. Just want to be with you. Come on, church, let's cry out this morning. Just want to be with you.